Hello everyone, we're back again with another video. Today I wanted to talk about a concept that I often mention in my videos, my critique videos particularly, the ones that I'm most known for, which is about gluconeogenesis. Not the concept broadly speaking, but specifically the conundrum that people have, this argument that happens in the carnivore space oftentimes, which is whether or not gluconeogenesis is strictly demand-driven, or if it has the capacity to become supply-driven if you consume enough protein, or even fat in certain circumstances, but particularly protein. I wrote a paper about this a few weeks back, actually, and it's a Patreon exclusive, or at least it was, and I wanted to talk about it in more detail for the public eye as well, because I think it's an important concept. You're not explicitly taught whether or not it is or is not strictly demand-driven or not in biochemistry when you learn the process. It's, it's not talked about because they don't think about it as anything more than a starvation pathway, and so they imply that it should be avoided at all costs in terms of the dependent on such a process for glucose yielding. So I wanted to really delve into this. I had to think it out myself, therefore, since they don't teach it. And so I'm just going to tell you exactly what my thoughts are as to why I believe and frankly am confident enough to say that it is a fact that gluconeogenesis can very well be supply driven. And in fact, no process in the body can strictly be demand driven because of the laws of physics. So let's get into it. So as I've already stated, there seems to be an interesting debate, to put it lightly, between between carbohydrate proponents and carnivore proponents regarding carbohydrate consumption being necessary for anabolism to occur within the body, which is necessary for survival. Anabolism is the building up and storing of things. So muscle building, that's an anabolic process. Fat storage, that's an anabolic process. Those are the two prototypical ones that I usually cite whenever I'm trying to convey what anabolism actually is. It's where the word anabolic comes from. Carbohydrate proponents state that you require carbohydrates to effectuate a sufficient insulin response for anabolism. While carnivores often state, like me, that protein ingestion, amino acids, stimulate insulin secretion very effectively, which is ostensibly why the vast majority of carnivores do not seem to suffer from the symptoms associated with long-term ketosis, which trends towards starvation. However, this raises questions, such as how protein affects glucagon and insulin secretion differently than carbohydrates do, whether gluconeogenesis is invariably a demand-driven process, and whether the body responds to protein ingestion identically in every context. Now, look, if amino acids do not affect actuate a sufficient insulin response to cause people to enter an anabolic metabolism without the consumption of carbohydrates. Carnivores would be starving to death left and right. Therefore, we can safely say that protein ingestion absolutely does affect insulin secretion sufficiently to effectuate anabolism, as fatty acids do not directly affect insulin secretion outside of the context of carbohydrate consumption. They do augment a glucose-mediated insulin response, however. However, it has been suggested that protein's insulinogenic effects highly depend on the underlying glycemic status of the body, at least in dogs. In such studies, in hyperglycemic situations, protein ingestion is associated with vastly augmented glucose-mediated insulin responses. However, in the case of euglycemia, so normal, steady glucose levels, protein ingestion seems to have hardly any effect on insulin secretion. However, the study that suggests this may not have used a sufficient amount of protein to cause a sufficient increase in insulin to enter an anabolic metabolism, since once again, we know that there must be a sufficient insulin response occurring within people who consume a carnivore diet, or else they would be dying left and right. This raises an interesting question, however. If protein ingestion outside of the context of carbohydrate consumption stimulates insulin release, would this not cause a hypoglycemic episode to ensue, even if slightly, since insulin is involved in lowering plasma glucose concentrations? The answer to this is clearly no, considering carnivores that measure their postprandial blood glucose levels with a CGM, so after they eat, show slight increases in blood glucose on average. So how is it the case that insulin can increase as well as blood glucose outside of the context of carbohydrate consumption. Well, this forces us to contend with the possibility that perhaps what we have been told about gluconeogenesis has been completely false. That being that gluconeogenesis, the creation of endogenous glucose, is invariably a demand-driven process, or one at all, like I alluded to in the beginning, and therefore only creates glucose when it is necessary for a cell to directly use glucose for certain bodily processes. If amino acids directly interacting with beta cells to release insulin is associated with an increase in blood Blood glucose levels when carbohydrates were not consumed, then something must have stimulated the release of glucose from an endogenous source. There's only one primary source for endogenous glucose in the context of a ketogenic individual, which is glucose derived through gluconeogenesis, as ketogenic individuals spend the majority of their time within the catabolic fasted state, and therefore do not have replete glycogen stores for ready breakdown into free glucose. Now, we know that gluconeogenesis as a process has two relevant primary precursors as well, those being glycerol and amino acids, as well as two primary stimulators, those being 
glucagon, which is a hormonal stimulator, and acetyl-CoA, an allosteric stimulator from hepatic fatty acid oxidation, and an influential inhibitor, but not an absolute one. That's the key there. That being insulin, which is also hormonal. Now, given this information, we can assume that the increase in the activity of gluconeogenesis, which may be enough to even further stimulate insulin release, this is an ambiguous idea as other sources claim that glucose created from such a process does not stimulate the pancreas to release insulin at all, but that seems a little silly, is from either an increase in circulating glycerol from lipolysis, somehow, we will hypothesize why this may or may not be the case soon, amino acids themselves being used to create such glucose, or something we haven't even considered yet, which is the glucagon secretion from the pancreas, which absolutely does occur from protein ingestion, is sufficient enough, given a significant bolus of protein, to increase the rate of gluconeogenesis. Now, this last suggestion would suggest that a certain I to G ratio is not what is required to preserve electrolytes, thyroid hormone production, and other important processes in the body that tend to fail to be preserved in a bona fide instance of long-term ketosis, but rather an absolute level of insulin, therefore making it possible for someone to still exhibit a low I to G ratio while simultaneously exhibiting a sufficient absolute level of insulin to maintain these processes in the body. And this makes sense considering glucagon is not involved in stimulating the degradation of or erosion of thyroid hormones and is not involved in causing the kidneys to alter the maintenance of electrolytes. So therefore, if glucagon doesn't affect those things, then an I to G ratio will not affect it, only the absolute level of insulin. So you can still have a low I to G ratio, but raise the absolute levels of both of them, and you could still get a preservation of all of those things. An important note to add here. If all of this is the case, the increased glycerol that can result from increased lipolysis from the increased glucagon can also be used to create this increased glucose in this situation, which can help to account for where the extra substrate could be derived to account for this increased gluconeogenic activity. However, if these situations are the case, could this therefore suggest that gluconeogenesis is, in fact, able to be supply-driven, preventing the subsequent decrease in the blood glucose some may expect from an exhibition of increased insulin secretion from the pancreas? Yeah, this is where we dive into an absolutely fundamental misunderstanding of chemistry, at least in my opinion. People seem to routinely misunderstand that the activity of chemical reactions is dependent on concentrations of substrates, partial pressures, and temperature via Le Chatelier's principle. The reason I bring this up is because of the fact this law therefore completely undermines the idea that a biochemical process can be exclusively demand-driven in the first place. The body does not impose strictures on processes within the body that determine whether or not said process will invariably be demand-driven or supply-driven. In fact, this fundamental misunderstanding goes even deeper, which is the idea that the human body has a volition of its own and therefore selects for substrates, has a favorite way or method of doing things, or has a preferred way of doing things, re preferred energy source, etc. We hear that a lot in the videos that I critique. The human body is a vast array of millions of chemical processes intertwined together in a systemic nexus, and therefore every process is subject to Le Chatelier's principle in terms of their activities. Therefore, if the concentration of a substrate attains a certain level, there may very well be a myriad of probable destinations for that substrate to migrate to if its concentration gradient dictates that to be the case, but eventually it will stimulate the activity of a process. This law is applicable to gluconeogenesis as well. If glucagon concentrations are high enough, the I to G ratio is still quite low, and there is an increase in the concentration of glycerol from increased lipolytic activity that can very efficiently be used in the gluconeogenic process, as well as amino acids that can also be used through such a process, then there is no reason to believe that the process would not increase in activity. So, with all that out of the way, why has gluconeogenesis been deemed to be demand-driven for so long? Well, ostensibly, this is due to the fact that gluconeogenesis, when depended on for glucose demands, operates at a steady, constant rate in a linear-like fashion, only changing slightly when glucose requirements, which are all non-oxidative, increase, and in a way that patently implies the exclusive creation of glucose that is required for physiological processes. But if it has been able to shift its activity rate in such a desultory fashion, as a result of it being subjected to Le Chatelier's principle, as I've just explained with respect to the supply-driven phenomenon, then why is it almost always operating at a steady, constant rate when dependent on for glucose requirements, therefore suggesting its existence as a demand-driven process? Well, this is quite simple, because when gluconeogenesis is being depended on for glucose demands, the relevant substrates and hormone levels in the bloodstream to the activity of such a process also remain constant, those being insulin, glucagon, glycerol, non-esterified fatty acids, and amino acids. And only when glucose demands increase does gluconeogenic activity typically increase. The other primary reason for this belief is due to the fact that most people that enter the fed state are doing so with meals that primarily consist of carbohydrates, therefore reducing gluconeogenic activity, as opposed to consuming meals that affect the body in such a way so as to most likely increase the activity of such a process. In the modern world of material science and technological revolution, almost everyone that has been studied has been consuming a carbohydrate and plant-rich diet. This necessarily affects our physiology differently than when we consume a diet that is bereft of 
carbohydrates, and therefore the assumptions that have been made about certain processes ought to be questioned, no matter how axiomatic they may appear to be on the surface. So I hope that that clears things up. I know that was very technical. Some of my videos are very simple. So that is basically my thought process on the entire thing. We absolutely know that gluconeogenesis can become supply driven. And in fact, calling it demand driven is a simplification and it's not technically accurate because no process in the body is inherently, necessarily, invariably, at all times demand driven. I hope that clears things up. I'll see you guys in the next video.